Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, we're going to look at our cool weather crops and some okra that's mixed in and see how they have progressed with the cooler temperatures. And the importance of leaves feeding your soil and not the plants. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored by the following. MIGardener.com, over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, organic flowers, vegetables, and herb seeds, all for 99 cents. MIGardener.com. Sioux Growing Supply, located in Wausau, Wisconsin, focusing on certified leaf compost, an excellent amendment for poor soil. With their new garden blend, improving soil structure in clay and sandy soil, great for creating new garden beds. Also available from Sioux, pre-filled trays and pots with professional potting soil mix or organic rice hull based potting soil mix. Bag and bulk of certified leaf compost also available. Visit SueGrowingSupply.com. Stop before you dig. Call Digger's Hotline first. Call three business days before you dig. It's the law. It's completely free and it's for your safety. Know what's below before you dig. It's your responsibility. Call Digger's Hotline or visit them at Digger'sHotline.com. HappyLeafLED.com, commercial grade grow light with a home gardener's affordability. No fans, no motors, simply plug in and grow. Great for seed starting, to lettuce, to full grown tomatoes, all indoors, HappyLeafLED.com. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, I'm Joy Baird. We are in the large garden, temperatures have cooled down, and we're looking at some of the cool weather crops that we planted for fall harvest. Now, what looks like okra here is really okra. Uh, these pods are drying. It's been a lot of rain, been very cold, 30, 35 degree nights. The okra has done what it's supposed to do. And we're allowing these pods, we can actually harvest these pods and bring them inside and let them dry to get seeds off that. That's a crimson spine okra, spineless okra there. What we have here is Brussels sprouts. If you're with us a couple of months ago, we topped these Brussels sprouts. We had had problems in, for years trying to get the sprout actually to develop. We found, and after research and experimental procedures here in the garden, by topping them about two months, uh, uh, right as the time you start to see the sprout begin to form at the junction of the leaf and the stalk, that's when we top, top the, topped them. And we just uh, took in, what that ac accomplishes is, it puts the plant in, I'm um, stop vertical growth, and start putting on the production of the sprouts. We've got two nice plants here, and these sprouts are marble to, tiny marble to large marble. They've got a little more time. They can handle this really cold temperatures that we're expecting in the next seven to 14 days. Same thing on this plant here. Uh, good, good shape on that. We actually have some phenomenal cabbage. We've never had cabbage this big before. <clears throat> I'm not sure the variety, because we planted several different varieties of cabbage, but this is, Oh, close to almost volleyball size, and that can be ready to harvest. This one here is a little smaller. That's uh, probably large softball size, but two very, very good green cabbages that we were able to grow. Here's some dinosaur kale that we can harvest and uh, at any time, and it's going to handle the, the cold frost and freezes way, way better than um, a lot of plants can. Back here we have some curly kale. Several different, varieties, several different stages, but all planted at the same time. <clears throat> and you can see how it does grow vertical. Now these here, these are no good. We can compost those. But this curly kale is doing really, really good. And the stalk, it's just like a tree is what it's like. So our cool weather crops doing very well. If you've never grown cool weather crops and just think summer is the only time you can garden, you wanna look at where you're at in the country and what you're able to plant very early in the spring and plant middle of summer for fall harvest. So Jerusalem artichokes are a perennial root crop that really can be grown anywhere. They need about 130 to 150 days of frost-free weather. They can get a variety of different sizes. We have a white uh, variety. There are some red or rose maroon varieties. And in a healthy and a really good crop, you're gonna get them between 12 and 15 feet tall. You can, they can grow in containers. As uh, you can see the height on some of these. They are related to the sunflower and they'll get really pretty yellow sunflower like flowers on the top of them. You want to wait until they die back and then it's time to harvest. You can harvest them all at once but the problem with that being is they don't have a long shelf life. 
you can harvest a bunch and actually mimic as if they were in the ground. You can put a, get a bucket, put dirt, artichokes, dirt, artichokes, dirt, and then you can store them in a very cool place. Now these are not related to the globe artichokes that we may be familiar with from the warmer climates of the United States or in the grocery store. So we uh, did not have a good crop of Jerusalem artichokes last year, so we took the largest tubers, replanted our bed, and then the things have seemed to have turned around. Now they will, they are invasive. They can be very invasive. So if you're going to decide to grow Jerusalem artichokes in an area of your yard or garden, you might want to consider doing it in a raised bed. This bed here is approximately 15 by 15 by 20-ish foot, and this is where they're always going to be. No matter how thorough you clean the bed, they're continually going to come back. So what can you do with them before I harvest some of them? You can eat them raw. You can dehydrate them. Uh, you can also put them in what we found to be a phenomenal uh, way is let them set in a crock pot with a roast and they become this very moist and, and buttery type of uh, tuber. Uh, they're less starchy, good for diabetics. Now check your, with your physician before you decide to go in, uh, just dive into this, uh, eating them. And they can cause gas, okay? I'll be straight up with you. But the longer you let them sit in the ground, the less that affects your body. Now that does affect some people more than others. So that's something you want to keep in mind. Let's go ahead and harvest this big one right here first and I'll show you what they look like. Uh, the best tool is to use a garden fork just simply because it's easy to let some of the tubers fall through and less opportunity of puncturing the, the tubers. Very similar you would a potato type of thing. Okay, I'll just leave it run. I'm going to wipe the screen off. I don't know how much moisture. Ready? Okay. So we'll just, now in a good container, good nutrients, you can get about 8, 10, 12 pounds off of one of these plants. Uh, we've seen that in this particular area uh, in years past. So you just want to loosen it up and you can see that is what they look like. Now, what do they taste like? Uh, rich, earthy, uh, kind of a cross between a parsnip, a carrot, a potato. It's a very unique uh, flavor they have. Some people really like them, others don't like them at all. So, if, you can, if you're thinking about you wanting to grow these, before you invest in your initial crop, which will last forever because their perennials will continue to come back, Try to find somebody who grows them and say, hey, uh, can I try these and see if I even like them? Some organic food co-ops and grocery stores will also have these at specific times of the year. So you can get a hold of some of them and see if you even want to invest in growing these in your particular region. And you can see these are very, very nice tubers. Very unique, knobby looking. Now last year we talked, I talked about um, not having a good crop. Now you can see right here, this is a nodular or, I'll, I'll go ahead and break this off. That's actually trying to regrow um, a new plant. Uh, it's a rhizome essentially, what it's trying to do. Now last year all of our beds was in this state and this state. So, I think these are going to have larger tubers than what I'm expecting. So let's see what I have here. Yeah. And not much there. Let's see what's in the ground here. Oh, there's some there. Okay. That's a nice one there off that. That one's broke off. But it gives you an example here of what I'm trying to demonstrate. Last year, that, that, was considered really, really large tubers in our artichoke bed. Um, so we took, we did have like one plant that was super, super big, and we saved all of those particular uh, tubers and replanted, and that's what we have here. You can also ferment these in a variety of different ways, but you want to follow uh, a, a recipe. You just don't want to kind of go in there and uh, mix some stuff together. So you can do a lot of things with them, uh, and fermentation is a good 
uh, probiotic for your gut as well. So if you've never grown Drew's or artichokes, try to find somebody who has that you may be able to try them before you decide to invest in your first crop. So it's the fall portions of the year and the leaves have not quite all fallen yet, but leaves create a great free fertilizer for your soil. The, the tree pulls the nutrients from deep down within the earth, puts in the leaves and the leaves fall and we can fill our garden beds with those rich nutrient filled leaves. Now whether you have maple or oak or whatever you have, some people are concerned about the maple spots and that's not a problem at all. It's not going to affect your, your garden. So what we have here, this particular bed, and we're going to do this with every bed that we have, this bed was very, very poor. We grew potatoes in it this year. We had a very poor yield of potatoes. So we've left it furl and we've just kind of made this in our little compost in garden bed and we're going to enrich the soil as much as we can in this bed as well as the other one. So what we've done here, just kind of threw a uh, cardboard box here. This was our garlic scraps when we trimmed our garlic leaves. We've got some eggshells, um, coffee grounds. We continue to add coffee grounds. So here's how we do our garden with the leaves. You can just pour the leaves right on the bed. Perfectly fine. Hit, uh, mound them up. We usually go foot to two foot high. Let them sit over winter. They'll break down about 75%. You can move them back, plant, and by June the next year you don't even know you put leaves in the garden because they've all broke down and fed the soil. You can also do what we're doing. We're going to take, first of all, uh, coffee grounds here. We're just going to spread them out. Coffee grounds, there's uh, some styrofoam cups, cups there that we will get out of the bed. The coffee filters will break down just fine. Now, how much do you add? Because this is a low uh, fertile, uh, the bed that didn't do very well, we're going to add more than probably what you would, would recommend. Normally, we would go about five gallon bucket over 20 to 30 square feet. You do want to mix these in. You just don't want to lay them on top because they have about a 2% nitrogen, uh, nitrogen in them and that will evaporate. So we want to cover them up or work them in. We're going to cover them up. So here's more coffee grounds. And you can see this bed is not smooth uh, or level at all. And if you want to get coffee grounds, just go to your local coffee shop and they will most likely tell you just bring a bucket in and they'll fill it up for free. You don't have to pay anything. So uh, again, I talked about this is all mounded up from when we harvested the potatoes. We're going to let that be normal until next spring. We'll figure out what we want to do then. Another thing, if you have a lot of shredded paper that uh, you can add as an organic material, worms like the shredded paper, you can leave the paper sack there. This will break down as well. You don't have to really worry about the ink. Most of it's soy based, so it's not really a concern. Now, another thing that we're doing differently this year is before we put the leaves down, we will take cardboard boxes, trying to remove as much tape off them as possible, and just lay that on top of everything. Now, this is we experimented with this a little bit in our straw bell garden last year, and it worked to a certain level. It almost acted like a weed barrier in the spring. We put the leaves on top now. In the spring, the weeds didn't really work through the cardboard, and it was pretty much a clean area. So that's what we're going to do with all our beds, or at least until we run out of cardboard. And you want to remove as much tape as you possibly can because that's not going to break down. So then we just take our leaves and pour on top of the bed. Uh, you can leave them mounted, you can vacuum them, you can mulch them. We usually go a foot to two foot. So that's how we deal with our leaves. And we'll go on the street and pick up the leaves on each side of the house, across the street, and bring in as many as we can. Last year, I brought in 42 40 gallon trash can fulls, this size here, into the garden and did not have enough. They were not mulched either. And uh, we try to find as many as we possibly can. Now you can also just find them pre-bagged that people will do that for you. And you can bring them in, store them, or you can dump them in your garden that way. So leaves, don't just throw them out. Thanks for watching. Join me again next time for more organic gardening and food preserving. I'm Joy Baird and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. For more information, please visit the